All right, then greetings, everyone. Uh, Van and Vivian here on this uh, final Sunday in October. And we're, uh, we're ready to continue on with, uh, with our study of essential, what, what we've come to think are some of the, some of the essential doctrines in, um, in Romans. Um, there certainly there are very many in, very important teachings in Romans. But we what we've done is we've selected a quantity of them, about ten in number, and that's what we're considering now. Our website midaxvancouver.ca, where the recordings are posted, they're also posted, actually primarily posted on our YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, the Vancouver Bereans. That's on YouTube. And uh, but at our website, uh, you're going to start to see some changes, especially in the graphics. Um, uh, Phil and Vivian and I have been working on some uh, some new new charts. We've come to the thought that the the classic mid ax uh, rightly divided dispensational chart. Uh, is fine, but there are some things that we've come to see uh, a little differently. We're not throwing it into the trash, but we are going to set it aside. Uh, we're actually going to revert more to where we started with Phil, and that was that the the main the main item uh, that distinguishes right division is mystery and prophecy. And in fact, if if you've ever have curious about starting a conversation with somebody about right division the place to start i would say would be on the matter of mystery and prophecy because that is something that most believers uh, really have just completely missed or haven't had the emphasis so uh, it will be a little bit more about that as we go into today's study so we're going to move ahead now and into the study where we're going to do a little catch up, a little recap of the doctrines, very quickly going through these doctrines, uh, the ones we're trying to plant them in our minds so that we see them without too much difficulty. Doctrine number one was that the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ, we compare them to see if they're the same or if they're different. Now, the point being that you go into any Christian church, any church of believers, regardless of denomination, and they will likely not see, except within right division circles, they will likely not see any difference between the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ. And certainly in a Presbyterian church, they will inform you they are both the same gospel, just different words. Well, I... I think scripture will differ with that. So let's look at this one more time. How does the gospel of God uh, compare to the gospel of Christ? Now, very quickly and very easily, this is not hard to remember. The gospel of God deals with promises. And we know that's true because in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, Paul writes about the promises. Now, the reason uh, the, this, the gospel of God is different is because the Messiah was promised. And that's why the gospel of God is different. It has to do with promises. And those promises are made to Israel, to the Hebrews. Whereas the gospel of Christ is about mystery. There are no promises to be found in uh, what we call the Old Testament, whether the law, the prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs, uh, major or minor prophets, there, there are no promises about the mystery. It's a mystery. And in fact, it was such a mystery that Satan didn't know about it, because if the princes had known uh, about the mystery, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's that's how significant it was that the gospel of Christ be separate and a mystery that is unstated, unsearchable in uh, from uh, from everybody until Paul came along. 
Can I just say that we yeah. don't have the scriptures up on this screen. We had them on the screen before. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the gospel of God is Romans 1, 1 through 4. Yes. And the gospel of Christ is Romans 1, verses 15 through 17. Yes. Okay. Now, so the question being, do both declare the same good news or are they different? We, we, we see from scripture they are different. And again, simple way to remember this is the gospel of God deals with promises. So that absolutely distinguishes it from the gospel of Christ, which is mystery. All right. Moving to number two. This is another very helpful teaching to remember about a Greek and a Grecian. And we're also going to cover the matter of a barbarian. So what is a Greek and a Grecian and a barbarian? And scripture does give us the information. So a Greek is an uncircumcised Hebrew previously cut off from his brethren. So he would be known as a Hebrew Greek. Titus, Timothy, and Trophimus were examples of Hebrew Greeks. That is, they were Hebrew by ethnicity, but in their culture and in their language, they were Greek. So being culturally Greeks, there was no circumcision. And as a result, they were cut off. So the Greeks were those that were cut off. The, rather, the Hebrew Greek was cut off. They're simply referred to in Scripture as a Greek. Now, a Grecian, which we see in, uh, in the New Testament in Acts chapter 6, the Grecians were Hellenized Jews. All Jews are circumcised. And in fact, we'll say again, there is no such thing as an uncircumcised Jew. The, the Jew is a Hebrew that is religious. They are circumcised. But note this, the Grecians were of Greek culture and language. So consequently, when the Grecians got together with the uh, Jews in Jerusalem, there was an issue in communication. They didn't speak the same dialect. The language, the language separated them. And so there were there were problems there. So that's what a Grecian is. A Jew, though and circumcised, though culturally and language-wise, of, of a Greek heritage. Then there is the barbarian. <clears throat> Paul says. In, um, in in his letter to the Romans, I think Romans chapter one verse fourteen, he declares that he was a bar that he was a barbarian. Mm -hmm. He declares that he was a debtor. He says, "I am debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians," and otherwise he doesn't speak a lot about barbarians. Now, who, who are the barbarians? The barbarians in the New Testament are non-Hellenic, that is, they're, they're not of Greek culture, they're non-Hellenic, they are uncircumcised, they're pagan or heathen, they're foreign in language and culture. So as an example, I would share with you that the Armenians, of which I am a descendant of the Armenians, would be barbarians as far as the Hebrews were concerned. Why? Because we didn't share circumcision, we didn't share language or culture with the Hebrews. So the Hebrews would see us as barbarians. There are other barbarians. I mean, those from Spain would be barbarians. Those from Portugal would be barbarians. Um, France, Britannia. They're all considered barbarians because they are different. Remember, the perspective is from Scripture. It is Hebrew-centered. So you, if I depart from that Hebrew center, then I'm going into barbarian territory. Uh, Van, in, the, um, in that verse, 14, uh, Romans chapter yeah. 1, when... Um, Paul says Greek and barbarian. He also says wise and unwise. 
And I believe that yes. with respect to scriptures, the barbarians were unwise with respect to scripture. They were not, not exposed in the same way that a, a, a Greek would have been because of some relatives like mothers and grandmothers that uh, knew the scriptures. Yeah, great. Thanks for adding that, Phil. Yeah, exactly. So the wise and the unwise is as Phil has now shared with us. So the, the, the Greek was considered wise um in in that they they, they well educated um all right then. can i just say that yes. uh we covered these top two topics yeah on our video of october the 15th yes two weeks ago yeah so this is a recapitulation you go back to the studies and you'll get the the full details on on these matters now just i will add here before we leave this particular doctrine that Paul did not declare himself to be a debtor to the Grecians. He said he was a debtor to the Greek and to the barbarian. Why didn't he say that he was, he was a debtor to the Grecians? Well, the Grecians were already believers. So they were Jews, they were believers, and in fact, gathering with the Jews in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6, demonstrates that they too had come, many of them had come to receive that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Christ. So Paul would be interested in the Grecians coming to his gospel, but he wasn't a debtor with respect to the, um, the, the gospel of God. All right, now we'll move to doctrine number three. This again, this is just a review, how to understand from faith to faith. This, uh, this is something that is really poorly understood from faith to faith. Many Bible teachers just simply step over it and say, well, we start with faith and we end with faith. That's all it's about. Well, faith to faith, as we understand Paul now sharing this in Romans chapter one, is the progressive revelation of God. The Jew was expected to have faith in the gospel of God. They were expected, why were they expected to believe the gospel of God? Because the prophets had spoken of the promises. The gospel of God deals with promises. The, the Hebrew, the Jew, was expected to believe the oracles of God. God held them accountable for that so they were they were called and then paul called them to have faith in the gospel of christ that is to move forward now not to abandon anything they're just moving forward from the gospel of god to the gospel of christ because the benefit paul says if you move forward to the gospel of christ you will be made righteous before God. So that simple belief in the gospel of Christ took the Jew who believed the gospel of God, that Jesus was the Christ, and now would make him righteous. So we have here in Romans 1, verses 16, 17, I'll have Vivian read this. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, so Paul is saying it as clearly as it can be written here that, uh, <clears throat> that the righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel of Christ. And we know the gospel of Christ is different from the gospel of God because of the word promise. Now, this is to show this. We have this chart which shows the progress of the Hebrew from Moses in the wilderness who needed to meet God in the wilderness because the faith of Abraham had been lost by the time Moses came around. God introduces himself to Moses. Moses has faith in God. Moses then introduces God to the, the Hebrew children and, and, and demonstrates himself to them. So they end up believing in God. Then 
later, Jesus comes and he says to them, you believe in God. Why do they believe in God? Because they believed him in the wilderness that God is. And then now Jesus says, you know, he doesn't say abandon anything. He says, no, add to what you know. You believe in God. Now believe also in me. So that's now we go from faith in God. We now add to that faith in the gospel of god so this is this is the progress of from faith to faith and then we have peter's declaration thou art the christ so here's peter understanding that the fulfillment of the promise is made in the person of jesus thou art the christ so now here's the accumulation from faith in god to faith uh, in the gospel of god and then we move on to paul and he wants something also. He says, he says that he declares the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. He says, by which also ye are saved. So this is another thing that the Hebrew was to add to that that they believed. They were to believe in God. They were to believe in Jesus. They were to believe in the gospel of Christ for salvation. So this is now faith in the gospel of Christ. And in the verse 17 of Romans chapter 1, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So not hard to understand, but really easy to mess up if we don't pay attention to what to every single word that is being stated in Scripture. We covered this in the video on October 22nd. All right, now we had stepped into last time uh, our fourth doctrine, which is how is it that the secrets of men could be or can be or will be judged by Paul's gospel? So we made a little bit of progress on this. We'll, uh, we'll, have, we'll, we'll pick up at the beginning because we won't depend on, on memory to, uh, for what we've covered. <laughs> so, Vivian, if you'll read these verses romans chapter 2 verses 12 through 16 for as many as have sinned without the law without law shall also perish without law and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law for not the hearers of the law are just before god but the doers of the law shall be justified for when the gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, so this is a difficult reading, admittedly, because in this reading there was this you know, Paul was uh, compelled to include this great big parenthetic thought, which just makes it difficult to maintain what exactly is being said. So we're going to we're going to treat this by first dealing with the opening verse 12 and the ending verse 16. We're just going to remove the parenthetic thought that is the words that are between the parentheses because there are just so many words there, it's hard for my little brain to track what's going on, the thought that Paul is trying to make. All right, so here's the way we'll look at it now. We'll, we'll come back to the parenthetic state. We're just going to set it aside for a moment, because the, the primary thought that Paul has is about, for as many have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So this is what we're going to take a look at first. Now, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men according to my gospel. So this is a statement that we see here in verse 16. Paul said something very similar, back parallel, to those on Mars Hill years before, remembering here now that 
that Paul's letter to the Romans is towards the end of his ministry. His time at Mars Hill was closer to the beginning of his ministry. Now, it's interesting to see just how consistent Paul's message is. So on Mars Hill, Acts chapter 17, verses 30 to 31, and, and I'll read this because we're going to be making some comparisons here in, in uh, Scripture. So at so I'm I'm looking now at 17 Acts 17 30 and 31 at the time and the times of this ignorance that is they were worshiping uh, the unknown God and and Paul says the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth men all men everywhere to repent. So, and that word repent is, we today we take it as stop sinning, repent. Uh, no, repent, uh, it, it means to change one's mind in, with, with regard to past action. So yes, I can change my mind about sinning, but it's a, that's a much too narrow an application. To change one's mind, in this case, has to do with this ignorance of God. So he's commanding men everywhere to change their ignorance about God. And then there's a colon. The colon says an explanation is coming. So why does God, uh, so why does Paul write that God is commanding men everywhere to, to repent? Because, these, these, these are words, Paul's words, because he, that is God, hath appointed a day. Now notice this, appointed a day. Paul writes in Romans 2.16, in the day. So God has appointed a day. Paul writes it, the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. So he's going to judge. And we see here in back in Romans 2.16, the word judge. A, the day God shall judge, a day in which he will judge, in Acts, the world in righteousness. This is, the, those would be the secrets of men being judged. And then Paul on Mars Hill doesn't name Jesus. He just calls him by that man. That's all the information they needed. They just needed to know that God was going to judge the world in righteousness by a man. Now, when Paul is writing to the Romans, and he's writing to Jews who happen to believe that Jesus is the Christ, they already know the name of Jesus. Now, Paul doesn't simply refer to him as that man. He refers to him by name, by Jesus Christ. He can do that, to the Romans because they're acquainted. They believe, many of them believe the gospel of God. So he refers to Jesus by name. But to the pagans on Mars Hill, isn't this interesting? He doesn't burden them with having to know who this Jesus Christ is. He just says, by that man. Interesting lesson for me as to how much I should burden somebody with information when, when really all we want them to do is to believe God for salvation. Paul actually limited the dump of information to the pagans. And he says, whom he hath ordained. Now that word ordained means uh, ordered, that is, uh, has uh, set in place an ordinance whom he hath ordered, ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him, that is that man, he has raised him from the dead. So there is a man that God has raised from the dead, and that we know that man to be Jesus Christ. But at the time, the pagans on Mars Hill didn't know who the man was. All they, All Paul told them was, that there is assurance that this judgment is going to happen because this man has been raised from the dead. That is Paul's gospel. This resurrection from the dead is Paul's gospel. So we have here 
in very uh, light form, without details, we have Paul's gospel. He says, "My this, this is my gospel. Now, let's take a look. Let's move forward now. Paul says, according to my gospel. So let's just take a look for a moment again at uh, Paul's gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll have, we'll have Vivian read this. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Verses 13 and 14. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is uh, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Verses twenty and uh, verse twenty. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. And verse twenty two. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, so the point that we're, we want to show here first is how in the importance of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, Paul said the believing this gospel would be futile. Paul said his preaching would be futile. Your faith would be futile. So the resurrection is absolutely central to the effectiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ. And Paul says, so he had said to the uh, pagans on Mars Hill, he said, assured by the resurrection. And then he writes here to the Corinthians, Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Then this very interesting, for as in Adam, in Adam, so we're all in Adam, and all in Adam, Paul says, in Adam, all die. That's just, that's the way of their flesh. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. So, the, the issue before us then is getting from being in Adam to being in Christ. I'm not automatically in Christ. Automatically, I'm in Adam. So I need to go from being in Adam to being in Christ. And we uh, that and that is achieved by what Paul has said here, the gospel which I preached, which you have received, and wherein ye stand. So you believe the gospel of the good news of God, that the righteousness of God is made uh, available simply by believing God, that he's achieved it uh, through Jesus Christ. Now, that's how he's achieved it. I don't even have to understand how God has done it. All I have to, under, all I have to do is just simply uh, believe God that he will make me righteous. And then I go from being in Adam to being in Christ. Now, if I want to understand and believe more, that's perfectly fine. But I need not burden somebody with a whole bunch of details because Paul didn't burden them on Mars Hill. If Paul had said, okay, here's the doctrinal checklist you need to have in place in order to be saved, and went through everything from confession and repentance to, uh, to all these details, uh, church membership, baptism. If, if, the, if that was a cry, Paul should have shared it to the pagans on Mars Hill. He didn't. I, I would think, though, that Paul, they, they would have asked questions who this man is. And he would have followed up with more information. Because I don't think that you he could have built a proper doctrine on just that absolutely uh liz you're absolutely right the 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 point the simple point though is that that at the end of Acts 17 verse 34 two individuals are declared by name to have believed paul just those few words that he said 
they believed him that was Dionysius and Damaris. They claved to and Paul. And they claved unto Paul. What did the others do? Many others just simply walked away. They scoffed at the resurrection. They, they scoffed <laughs> at it. They, they walked away. So if, if they scoff at it and walk away, then they're not going to learn anything more. But Dionysius and Damaris are two. We're going to meet Dionysius and Damaris, have a chance to sit down with them someday and ask them, what was it like? Because believing through believing, yeah. they're sealed and saved. Mm -hmm. Saved and sealed. That's right. So Dionysius and Damaris, at that moment that they believed and they, they clave unto Paul, they were saved, sealed, and seated by God in the heavenly places. Okay. I'm also wondering okay. if anybody has any thoughts on 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, where it says, if ye can, if we're that um, condition, if, um, if ye keep in memory what I preached to you, is that just kind of like an if, well, if you're going to the store, pick me up some butter kind of thing, or is this a conditional no, it's, if? It's it's what Van spoke of of the resurrection. It's, if if you if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. So it's since since you have kept in memory what I preached unto you. Now the part about unless ye have believed in vain, there were some Hebrews, uh, namely the Sadducees, who. Um, refused to believe in the resurrection the sadducees didn't believe in the res in resurrection they didn't believe in angels there were a number of things that the sadducees did not believe and they were proponents of not believing so they would go around and try to persuade others that there's no such thing as a resurrection of the dead uh, so paul points out here he says unless you have believed something futile but paul is teaching that christ is risen the sadducees said no way that doesn't happen paul is saying it does happen that was the issue okay so what you're saying is it's the you're he's trying to explain trying to make the the point that it's the resurrection that is what we're saved by it, 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 going because now i'm thinking back to romans 5 10 um where it says we are saved by his life yes so the, the 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 point being that the righteousness of god is made available to us because christ has been resurrected it's actually it's an enabler that's how god makes us righteous because we're being placed in christ simply by believing that he has raised him and then that righteousness is imputed to me it's imputed to everyone that believes it just simply believing it faith that's the how it was done we don't need to know the exact uh, mechanism of how it was done yeah and this is where the you know churches today burden us that we have to know how it was done well it doesn't or, appear or they add to or they, or they add to they, they, make, they make <laughs> i have we, we've we've been accused in the past of easy believism who's heard of easy believism you know like <laughs> you <laughs> all right <clears throat> you have to know a whole lot more and submit to a whole lot more truth before you can be saved and if you don't then you just think easily you can be saved simply by snapping your fingers. I believe God, I'm saved. Well, there is a there is a condition of the heart. If the heart believes, God knows it, that person is saved. Okay. I'm gonna I'll move on. Well, just, just a sec. Um yes, so I, yeah. I don't know if it's a matter of uh of how um you know um how it how it works it's maybe more a question of what you know uh, uh, we have to know in order to be saved not how mm. you know what i'm saying i think i do like, um 
like you're talking like, about what? you know knowing the, all the details of how christ made it possible for us to be saved and i yes. can agree with that but i think we still need to know what we have to repent of repent into to believe so that we can be saved change your mind you know it's a change of mind and yeah. a change of mind yeah it is a change of mind yeah. because it, again just you know yeah. believing in in god i mean that can be anything to anybody it's to um i i think we need i think we need, i mean even in verse 32 of that um of act 17 yes you know there there are those who mocked and others said we will hear thee again of this matter and although yeah. we're not given the details of that conversation we can only maybe uh fill in the blanks there that he did tell them um exactly what it was but that that this matter was about you know this resurrection of the dead and 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 who christ is um that's something that they had to know and then, and then hearing that uh dionysus and um damaris and it says in verse 34 and others with them you know yep. they can't yes. believe they, so they believe they believed that uh, uh, God had appointed a day yeah. by whom he would judge the world by that man who he assured most assuredly yeah. raised from the dead. Yeah. Those that's what they had to believe. Yeah. Now, the 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 matter before us in Acts 17 is actually not so much about and I this is going to sound bad when I say it, but it's not so much about that man whom he hath uh, raised from the dead, it's about believing in the right God. So Paul actually takes effort to explain who is this God that they ignorantly worship. And he says, the God that you should worship is the God in which we, by which we live and move and have our being. That was the issue for Paul, was identifying the correct God to believe for salvation. Not, not those pagan gods, which they ignorant, uh, which right. they had been worshipping. Exactly. They were so, ignorant of that God. So Paul at Mars Hill was not there so much to try and preach Jesus Christ to them as you know, and that seems like odd, but really what he was doing was he was differentiating the correct God to worship from the uh, from the pagan gods. So he says, the God that you are ignorantly worshiping, he says, God has winked at this ignorance, like he's let it go by, and now he wants you, he's commanding all men everywhere to change their mind. And to believe in the proper, the right God. Who made heaven and earth and everything in it. That's right. So this God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. And has made everything. He's made you and I. And since he has made me, then I would be responsible back to him for everything. That's the point that Paul is making. Then Paul continues to say... He's going to judge me for what I believe. Now, that judgment is going to be done by a man who has been resurrected from the dead. But that actually, uh, you know, that actually is subsequent information that is Paul is offering as in as a motivation, as an incentive to move away from the pagan gods move towards the one true God in whom we live and move and have our being because he's going to judge. That's the issue. Now, I, I know that's so different than what we've been taught and our brains are so full of the doctrines of churches that it's very hard to wrap your head around it. But if you spend time with this passage in Acts 17, 22 to 34, and look at what Paul primarily puts forward. It is the worship of the correct God. 
Okay, I'll move forward then. Now, we have finished with that little piece, and we're going to look at the parenthetic, the, the parenthetic statement. Uh, and the parenthetic statement here is, so there's a bracket at verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. A lot of words. Very complicated. Let's see if we can unpack it. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So the, the doers. Romans 3, verses 19 and 20. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, so Paul says here in Romans 2, uh, 13, he says, the doers of the law shall be justified. Well, we have a problem with properly understanding the word justified. Justified doesn't mean isn't the same as the word just. It is it is a word that says there is evidence. So justified is that is one is accounted righteous, supported by evidence. For instance, we would say, what is your justification or how are you justified in doing that? So when someone asks the question, how am I justified? What do I have to do? I need to provide the evidence to support my justification, my reason for being just in doing something. So Paul says that the doers of the law shall be justified, that is, the doers of the law are going to be examined for evidence that they are righteous. Now, Paul then says in Romans 3, he says, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, because the law is the knowledge of sin. So what Paul is setting up here is that the doers of the law, these who did the law, and thought that they were going to be able to provide evidence that they are righteous are barking up the wrong tree. Doers of the law. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, and now, now these Gentiles would be the Hebrew Greeks. So they're familiar with the law, but they don't have the law. When they do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not a law, are a law to themselves. So all the uncircumcised, starting with the Hebrew Greek, have not the law. The law was those, was those that were the Jews. They were the ones that had the law. They, But however, the Gentiles were doing certain things, and these things that they were doing were things contained in the law, then they were a law to themselves. So they had a sense as to right and wrong. And Paul goes on to say, which shows the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So, who knows what's going on in my conscience? Only I do. That would be the secrets of men. My conscience is my secret. Then there are their thoughts. My thoughts are my secret. 
So we've got the conscience and the thoughts of men, the mean. Now, the word mean is also understood as a go-between. So the, the conscience and the thoughts of a man, my thoughts, are the go-between whether I accuse myself or excuse myself from doing something. And if you've ever experienced this, you look at doing something, you think it's wrong, but maybe it's okay. I'll do it anyhow. Or maybe I think about it and I say, no, I really shouldn't do that. And I feel really guilty. And so it accuses me, I back away from doing something. So my, my conscience and my thoughts either let me do something or hold me back from doing something. So these are the secrets of men. They're going to be judged, every one of these secrets, for those that are not in Christ, they're going to be judged. Therefore, Romans 3.20, Vivian reads this. Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, so all the law does is it lets me know that I've exceeded the speed limit. That's what the law does. Romans 4, 5. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies, justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, so notice. It is just believing on him. That's all that's necessary. Believing on him, that is the one true God. The one true God is the one that justifieth the ungodly. And that believing is counted for righteousness. So this one true God that I should believe on for righteousness is the one who has made heaven and earth and in whom I live and move and have my being. We know who he is now. We know he's he's uh, Jehovah God, and he is the one true God. Now, Romans 22, 4, I say, Romans chapter 4 again. Romans <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 22b, and verses 24 and 25. Verse 22b, imputed to him, that is Abraham, for righteousness, verse 24. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. Okay, so it's so easy to miss this. It says, believe on him that raised up Jesus. So if I'm believing on him, who am I believing on? for salvation the one true god believe on the one true god so abraham believed on the one true god who made heaven and earth and he believed on him and this is before there was any jesus raised from the dead he believed on him and it was imputed to him abraham for righteousness now Yes, I'm going to be accused of easy believism, but it appears to me that's exactly what the text is saying. Believe on God, and he will impute you to righteousness. But, you know, if you if you look at, if I could just say, if you look at ancient religion, and they believe on the sun god and Tammuz, um, that it was Tammuz that God raised from the dead. I don't know if anybody is familiar with those ancient paganism. Yeah. Um, I think we do have to know who it is that God raised from the dead. And because God wants to give all glory to Jesus Christ. And he wants that imputed to him, all that glory as well. For both yes. of them. I, you know, yes. No argument. No, no argument, Liz. But when we, if we, if we take somebody who is completely ignorant of the scriptures, and we say, well, you know, you can't be saved unless you believe this list of things, we are burdening more than what Paul expected of the pagans on Mars Hill. Now, I wonder, I, you know, just 
if I can be, uh, I wonder if it's us that we're, we're burdening because I know for myself, sometimes, you know, if I'm talking to somebody, sometimes, you know, I'm reluctant to say Jesus Christ because I know it can be offensive. So yeah. it, is it because, I mean, we can, we, we can <laughs> share about the Lord, but I think we don't have to burden them by going into the law and going into the covenants and, and going, you know, back with them with all of that information. I think that's what would be burdening to them. But, you yeah. know, I have to ask myself, is it really taking the burden off of me? Yeah. I mean, your, your point, and, and, and these are difficult things. And I, 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 I hear what you're saying and I'm, I'm not trying to, to say, well, you, you know, this is the only way to believe it. I, I, and what I'm pointing to is the simplicity of salvation during the dispensation of the grace of God. So it's by grace that we're saved, not by doctrine. And by it's the grace of God that saves me. And if we someday we will we will come to understand just how simple it was for us to be saved today we tend to look at each other and say, well, their doctrines in that church aren't right. They can't be saved. Isn't that true? And there are certain churches we say, well, you know, their doctrines are not good. They're probably not saved in there. That's that's what our pattern is. Judging one another. We, we people... tend to judge. <laughs> now, how can that be grace? How can that be the grace of God if when we're judging each other that their doctrines aren't right. Okay, let's move on. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So those that are in Christ Jesus are those who now walk not after the flesh, but they walk after the Spirit. So it's, this is not a condition of walking that they have to walk. They, because they are in Christ Jesus, they have been transformed. The believer is transformed. He walks after the spirit, not after the flesh. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So the, the point being that Paul says that if I am in Christ, by believing God, I am a new creature. I have still have my old creature, but there is now a new creature. The old is passed away. That's how God sees it. It's finished. Positionally. Positionally finished. Now, I not, my standing is in Christ. But my old is passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's God's perspective. So my comment here is all the Hebrew saints, all Hebrews, saints and called to be saints, found in Christ, according to Paul's gospel, will not be condemned, but they will be judged for reward or loss of reward. So when Paul says that the secrets of men are going to be judged according to my gospel. What the judgment concerns is whether or not an individual is in Christ. If they are in Christ, then they pass from death unto life. Now, partakers of the benefit, because partakers of the benefit are not saints or called to be saints, they have no prospect of any future judgment. I need not be concerned about being judged beyond this life. So here's the summary for how will the secrets of men be judged whether or not they are righteous by Paul's gospel? How will this happen? Acts 17.31. Acts 17, 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So God is going to judge all men by Jesus Christ. 
And we have here in Romans 8, 1a. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And then 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So then this is the this is the the uh, differentiation this is how all men will be judged by Paul's gospel they are either in Christ Jesus or they are in Adam if they are in Adam they will die if they are in Christ Jesus they will be made alive eternally that's the conclusion of the matter this is how that judgment will occur. Okay, so we finished this doctrine. We're ready to move on to another doctrine. And that is, who's included in Paul's statement, Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh. Now, we don't have enough time to complete this, uh, this particular doctrine, but I'm going to start it because... I, we should repeat it next time. The part that we've covered, uh, we should repeat because this is so poorly understood uh, from the English, and you'll see it in a moment that it's go it's going to bear it's going to need to be repeated. Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, who's included? Romans four one. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Okay, now as pertaining to the flesh hath found. You go to the OED, and one finds that <clears throat> the word pertaining, so I look up the word pertaining, and the definition in the OED is, this is the third person singular impersonal, and the present participle where used in the phrase as pertaining to equals in regard to or in relation to. So the OED then gives as an example, Tyndale 1526 Bible New Testament, Romans 4 verse 1. This is the way the Old English read, Abraham, our father, spelled with an E, as pertaining, notice how pertaining is spelled, was spelled way back in 1526, pertaining to the flesh, ending with an E. And then the OED also gives the Bishop's Bible, 1568. Now these Bibles, Tyndale and Bishop, they were in the line of Bibles leading to the King James Bible, 1568. Based on the same manuscript. Same manuscript. So what's, what's being improved upon is the spelling, spelling and punctuation, things, and notes. Uh, so in 1568, you'll see that the uh, the spelling is changing. Um, <clears throat> Romans chapter 9, verse 3, my kinsman as pertaineth to the flesh. Now, pertaining... So the OED says that this is a present participle where used in the phrase as pertaining to. So you say, well, what in the world is a present participle? So we've all we've all forgotten. We don't know these things anymore, but this is important. It was important to the translators, the 54 men working on the King James Bible. The word pertain is a verb. When the word ver pertain as a verb has the, the letters ing added to it, it converts the verb to an adjective. So now the word, the verb pertain is now an adjective. Pertaining. Pertaining. And adjectives, what do they modify? They modify nouns. So we know then that the adjective, the, the, the present participle, and the word present means at that present time. So we have pertaining, that would be a modification of 
Abraham our father. And it is it is modified with the words pertaining to the flesh. Now, this is important because we're going to see in just a moment that when scholarship goes through this, they don't know what this word pertaining is, and they all think it can be changed to an adverb. And you're going to see the adverb in a moment. An adverb doesn't modify a noun. An adverb modifies a verb. That change is going to turn the understanding of this verse on its ear. Now, pertaining to the flesh, so we now, we would see, if we understand this correctly, that those who descended in the flesh from Abraham were all Hebrews. What this has to do about are the Hebrews. For we, Abraham, our father, comma, as pertaining to the flesh, comma, hath found. Now notice what the, the, the modern versions say. So here is the English Standard Version of Romans 4.1. Notice what they've done to the wording, how they are going to show that they don't understand what's going on. They say, what then shall we say was gain? This is the ESV. Oh, I'm sorry, the ES. What did I say? You didn't say what version okay. it was. So this is the English ESV. That's English. English Standard Version. Very popular. I think it's probably more popular now than even the NIV. The English Standard Version what shall we say was gained? So they think that the word found is better translated gained. <laughs> Why? Right. There's a little bit of overlap in the sense of understanding between the word found and gained, but otherwise they're very different words. And then there's a comma by Abraham, comma, our father, according to the flesh. Now, the word according, that is not an adjective. The word according is what? It's a verb. However, it's an adverb. So, what they've done is they've changed the adjective of the present participle pertaining to an adverb, which is according. This is going to mess up the, how we understand. Romans chapter 4. Look at the New King James Bible, which of or the version, I should say, which also they have no punctuation, it's just no no commas, and they have the word we, and then they have the word according. Again, we they have abandoned the adjective, the present participle pertaining, they've abandoned it and they put in an adverb according to the flesh. Look at the American Standard Version. What then shall we say that Abraham, comma, our father, comma, hath found, huh, according to the flesh. So these three versions, this here, you can see the perversion, what's going on, that they've changed the present participle pertaining, which modifies the noun, the noun Abraham, our father. They've, they've added according, which is an adverb, which now modifies a verb, and the verb is found or gained. So they think that what should be modified is this matter of found. Now, refer, we refers to whom? And that's the issue. Who's the we here? These tra modern translations are going to end up saying that this is you and I. The King James is clear. The other versions now have left this very ambiguous, very difficult to understand unless you simply go with the way they're pushing. 
They push me in a different direction. There's an entirely different direction. Now, looking at verses 1 and 2, now what happens here is that scholarship looks at verse 2, and they think that verse 1 should be changed to harmonize with verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Now, this is what's happened here with scholarship. They look at these words, if Abraham were justified by works, and they surmise by that statement, if Abraham were justified by works, that Abraham must have been looking for a way to justify himself before God by works. Well, was Abraham ever looking to be justified by works? Is there anything in Scripture that demonstrates that Abraham looked to justify himself before God by works? Not according to Scripture. Romans 4, verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, what Paul writes, what saith the scripture? Where is that found? Genesis 15, 6. Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So here's the common misunderstanding. This is my comment that Abraham, this is the misunderstanding. So what I'm saying is this is how it is incorrectly understood that Abraham needed to find, he needed to find out that he could not be justified by works, that he needed to discover this for himself. That's why they're changing the word pertaining to the word according. They want to make the case that Abraham needed to find out that he could not be justified by works, when in fact, there is no scripture that says that Abraham attempted to justify himself before God. Rather, what we read is that Abraham believed God. That's all he did. God said something to him. God, uh, Abraham believed it. And then that was counted to him, Abraham, for righteousness. Abraham was imputed righteous simply doing no more than believing what God had said to him. So then, how does biblical scholarship typically understand Romans 4.1? I'll share a couple of commentaries with you. David Brown and Fawcett, Jameson, and Brown, what he says in his commentary is that this means by all his natural efforts or legal obedience, by that Abraham, by all his natural efforts or legal obedience, I, I can't imagine where David Brown came up with evidence to support that kind of a statement. This is, this is really, this is just scholarship telling you what they think as opposed to what the scripture says. Matthew Henry says something a little bit better, but Matthew Henry is going to miss the point as well. Matthew Henry says, he, that is Paul, appeals to the case of Abraham, their father, and puts his own name into the relation, being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, Abraham our father. So what Matthew Henry gets right, and that David Brown completely misses, is that this is about Hebrews. And that's true. This is about Hebrews. It's a, not about me, a Gentile or a barbarian. So Matthew Henry understood Romans 4.1 was not to be spiritually applied to the body of Christ. That much he got right. But otherwise, all these men have have actually tripped on the present participle pertaining and they have gone in a different direction and they've asked us to go along with them okay so 
we're, we're going to wrap it up and leave it here. We'll pick up next time with what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found. So as pertaining to the flesh, of whom would Abraham be father as pertaining to the flesh? This is what's important, why we need to have this present participle as opposed to, uh, which is an, an adjective, as opposed to the word according, which is an adverb. So we'll stop there and we'll pick up next time as we find out what's going on here in Romans chapter 4, verses 1, 2.